to the 26th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, let me remind everybody, including the gallery, that um, mobile phones and electronic devices should be switched off. They can interfere with the sound system. You may use uh, tablets if you're witnesses or members, as they are part of the process of the meeting papers and so on. Agenda item one is subordinate legislation. The first item today for the committee to consider is the South Arran Marine Conservation Order 2014 SSSI 2014 stroke 260. Uh, members should note that no mention to a null has been received in relation to this instrument and I refer members to the paper and ask if there are any comments about this uh, subordinate legislation just now. There are none so far. Uh, I'm just going to raise the fact that uh, in the paper which we've been presented with, it's clear that in terms of marine protected areas that the subject is extremely sensitive and that one of the policy objectives was hastened uh, for this order uh, in order to try and curb one fishing vessel which had made... Uh, uh, had broken the, the voluntary agreement not to trawl in the marl beds on that ground. And uh, that's why this order was brought in uh, at an earlier stage than the usual 28 days. And uh, therefore, we understand why this happened. And I just wanted to put on record that we're glad about the vigilance with regard to uh, marl beds and the difficulties of policing them. Uh, and that, uh, indeed, we'll be very interested to see how they start to recover in due course. But apart from that comment, are there any others? Yes. Just gives me the opportunity to note we, we don't usually worry about these things, but the advantage of the negative procedure on these things is that it can be brought in immediately. Uh, and we sometimes feel that the affirmative procedure is more important because it gives us more time to scrutinise things, but actually there are times when you don't want time. You just need to get on with it. Thank you very much. Any other comments with regard to that? So are we agreed that we don't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument at present? We're agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, uh, the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland 2013 annual report. This second item today is for the committee to take evidence on uh, the Wildlife Crime annual report for 2013 from Police Scotland and the Lord Advocate's Office. The committee will follow us up with evidence session next week with the Minister, and we welcome our witnesses today. Malcolm Graham, uh, Assistant Chief Constable, Major Crime and Public Protection, Police Scotland. Good morning. Uh, Robbie Allen, Detective Chief uh, Superintendent, Wildlife Crime Portfolio Holder in Police Scotland. Welcome and uh, Patrick Hughes, Head of Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Good morning. Uh, we'd like to kick off with a look at some issues related to the data in this report. Now, we recognise that it, uh, in order to have data, you have to have a good number of years' data to be able to draw any conclusions about uh, the relative merits of it. And um, looking at the data, there have been some suggestions that um, it, it, it could be clearer, but um, if we look at the quality of the data, why is uh, you know the 2013-14 data not yet available? Uh, and why does the report use a mixture of calendar year and financial year information <coughs> for a start? Just indicate if you want to, uh, to answer and uh, the sound system will take care of your microphone. Malcolm Graham. OK, thanks very much. Uh, I think the, the, the main answer to that question is that it is a Scottish Government report, and the Scottish Government are responsible for the reporting period um, that it covers. I think it would also be safe to say that it is very much a work in progress, that the first of such reports, as committee members will be aware, was produced last year, and this year's report has sought to build on that. But I think if the observation is, could the data be more consistent throughout the report and could it be more timely, then I think the answer to both those questions in the future is yes. 
um, it should be. And indeed, some of the data that you refer to would be available. But I think my understanding of the challenges posed is that it attempts to draw together data from a variety of different sources and source organisations and therefore to get some degree of comparability and consistency the government have made a decision um, to look at the reporting year of a calendar year although you will see that some of the data um, and particularly that from the police is working on the financial year which would be consistent with all of the data that the police produces. Okay. Um the only thing that, uh, that I would add to that is that the terms of the report focus specifically on a calendar year. So the main focus of the report should be on the data which relates to calendar year 2013. The data which has been provided by the Crown Office does relate to 2013. I think that's true for some other data, but not for all of the data that's in the report. You ask why... Uh, data is provided in terms of financial or accounting years, and I think that depends, obviously, on the organisation which provides it. You will see from the report that data has been provided which goes back over a number of years, again, for financial and accounting years. My understanding is that the reason why the data has been presented in that way is to assist understanding and to provide some kind of context. I think as we move forward, the expectation would be that, obviously, this uh, report will be a recurring event, that in the future... All of the data will focus on calendar years and that as we build up uh, a database then we'll essentially be able to compare one um, year, one calendar year against another and that would help uh, considerably. I should say that as well that I think we're all conscious that um, there are, in terms of understanding the data and in terms of its presentation and its clarity, there is room for improvement. I should say as well that we have agreed uh, with the Scottish Government that our technical staff will have a meeting um, ideally within the next month to clarify the extent to which the statistics that we use can be brought into line with each other which would mean that the report for next year will hopefully be presentationally um, easier to understand. Thank you very much. Um, with regard to the clearer picture uh, of trends in the data um, have you thought about disaggregating categories so, so that poaching offences can be seen as a separate category? I have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the Crown Office data doesn't do that. Um, at the moment, there is no uh, pro um, proposal from the Crown Office to disaggregate data which would uh, relate to poaching as opposed to other wildlife offences. I think part of the difficulty is that wildlife crime uh, has a definition which has now been agreed through the um, Partnership Against Wildlife Crime in Scotland, which is its acts or omissions which have an effect on any wild animal or environment. Now, that's the position that we are currently working in. At the same time, however, a great deal of the legislation which applies to this field has essentially been inherited from previous eras. Uh, the You'll know yourselves that a consolidation statute was recently passed which effectively brought together and harmonised as much as possible the various statutes that we had. But we do have the position that although some uh, wildlife crimes are directed at the, at the welfare of an animal, at the, the need to protect uh, endangered species, other ones are effectively inherited from previous game acts, uh, from the Deer Act, and are much more focused on, on poaching. So in terms of the, the, the different statutory provisions have uh, a different impact on the crime depending on the nature of the crime. But I'm sorry to answer your question. Um, at present, uh, we don't, certainly from the Crown Office's point of view, we wouldn't propose to disaggregate that data. I understand why uh, now, but we thought to ask because clearly that's something that hits the headlines uh, separately and people understand the concept of poaching perhaps uh, in a way. Uh, if no other members have a question on data, I would like to move on to, there may be more I suppose later as we go through, detection of uh, wildlife crime. Uh, Jim Hume. Uh, convener, uh, good morning to all. Um, obviously you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know, if that makes sense, but um, I'm just trying to explore how much the data means in looking at trends, uh, because we actually see, a, a, oh, for example, if you look at the um, some of the incidences of wildlife crime regarding illegal pearl mussels, um, the, the fact that a river watcher started uh, 
watching the river, they started to find out that there was more crimes than was thought before. So in 2012, uh, there was two regarding pearl mu muscle crimes, uh, and there was eight in 2013, but six of those were discovered by the river watcher through the survey, which did not happen before. Similar with um, uh, uh, other animals too. And in fact, the Scottish Raptor Study Group, they consider that um, we only know about the tip of the iceberg re regarding um, raptor crime. Um, so it'd be interesting to, use, to f find out from yourselves whether you have any estimate of the proportion of different types of wildlife crimes that go undetected and uh, if those are low, which they probably are, is it meaning, meaningful to actually look at trends from year to year when actually the research is changing year on year? I, I don't want to get myself muddled up with the known knowns and known unknowns uh, analogies, but I think it's safe to say that there are quite a number of known unknowns in the world of wildlife crime investigation, as there are in relation to uh, quite a large number of other crimes that are reported to the police, or indeed crimes that we have to proactively seek. And, and wildlife crime falls into both of those categories, so some of them uh, will only be found by the police, or indeed other agencies proactively seeking them, uh, as you've referred to, uh, but a number are recorded as a result of being reported to us by a member of the public uh, and then further inquiry takes place. So I think the known unknown is that there's uh, a reasonable proportion of wildlife crime which will go unreported to the police. We accept that and therefore some interpretation that can be put on the figures is to say that an increase in reporting can be seen as an improvement in our ability to detect that the crimes are happening. Now, it's always very difficult to get beneath that and say what proportion of any increase is down to uh, improved scrutiny or monitoring. And you need to look at cases uh, often uh, individually or, or in groups as they occur, as you've referred to, where you can perhaps attribute a specific finding to a specific bit of activity in, in one particular area. Uh, and we have got some examples where that has happened across the piece. I think the other thing to say is that the numbers of reported crimes, um, and you used the term tip of the iceberg, um, I can only put a feel on that from everything that we're getting from all of the intelligence sources that the police would use, and indeed the information that we get from the other groups that we work with. And it doesn't give me a sense that we are dealing with the tip of the iceberg. It does give me a sense that there's undoubtedly uh, crimes that are unreported to the police and therefore go unrecorded. Um, and what level that's at, I couldn't put a judgment on, but it doesn't feel like we're only getting the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and therefore, I think the final important point is that because the numbers are so small of many of the recorded crime categories, I think it is very difficult to... Uh, with any validity, look at trend analysis. If you're looking at numbers that are, in some cases, for certain crime types uh, against particular animals, for instance, um, as, as few as 5, 10, 15, 20, doing a year-on-year -year comparison uh, and trying to put any validity behind that, given that much of what we're speaking about uh, may be unknown, I think is very difficult. So the, the, the trend analysis does have to come with some caveats, I think. Okay, uh, and just to follow up on that, if I, I may, convener, um, that's that's interesting. I'm glad you're saying it. You don't feel that, and I realise it's just a feeling, but you're in a perfect position to get that feel that it's not a, the tip of the iceberg. That is quite uh, reassuring in some respects. Um, but it would be interesting to explore where you think we can improve our information, whether whether it's using amateur uh, naturalists' experiences, perhaps um, some scientific s studies of actual wildlife populations, etc. I mean, is that happening at the moment? Can that happen more? Or, uh, I'm, I'm sure this isn't the case, but uh, is it purely reactionary to when somebody reports you go out and uh, look? Or is there some proactivity where you actually work with um, some of these groups already? Yeah, absolutely. We'll work proactively with as many partners as, as, as we can bring on board to, to, to paint that picture for us. I think going forward, one of the big things we do is, is this raising awareness, making sure that 
what is out there to be reported to us does actually come to us. So do we look at modern technology around about the use of apps and things like that for people that, that they come across wildlife crime out there? But, but very much we, we attend all of the, all the various groups and study groups and, and link in with those just to understand what that whole picture looks like to, so that it does start to inform us. What we lay that across is, is the intelligence that we are receiving, the different reports that come into us just to try and paint that, that full picture. But I, I would agree our, our, our kind of assessment at the moment is it is not the tip of the iceberg. I think we're getting a fair flavour of, of the wildlife crime that's out there, but there's undoubtedly an unreported number within that. No, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks, Thanks Don. Thank you, Fenwick. I'm just thank you, Mr. Allen. I'm just wondering if I can pick up on that. Uh, uh, this is I, I feel like I'm the wrong generation for this app thing. But if I were to take a walk through the countryside, which I do very often, find myself looking at something suspicious, and I wouldn't actually even know what suspicious is, but maybe you could educate me on that. Would I be in a position to? To please. But <laughs> Would a I be special in a seminar. Would I be in a position to, to download an app that would enable me to take a photograph, send it to the right place, maybe even get back the right questions that I should then be asking myself to observe? Yeah, the, the, we've started a bit of work on that. It would be hopefully a photograph, and also what it would do is it would locate you at the time that you're taking it, and that's the most important part of that. So if there was a dead animal, for instance, found that there was any suspicion around about how, how that animal had died, that would be the perfect way of, of reporting that. It's instant. It's coming straight to us. We can start to put the appropriate measures in at the back of that. So I think we need to really start embracing modern, modern technology and using that sort of technology to, to get that reports in and make it as easy as possible for members of the public or anyone to, to make the reports to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Wildlife Crime Reports <coughs> and Proceedings, uh, Graham Day. Thank you Good morning, gentlemen. Maybe now deal with what we do know or appear to know. Uh, according to Table 1A in the report, there were 1,554 um, wildlife crimes recorded in the period 2008 to 2013. Yet according to Table 9, there were uh, proceedings taken in only around 19% of those instances over that period. And I think the figure for 2012-13 is about 23%. If those figures are accurate, what message does that send to perpetrators of wildlife crime? It, it, because it appears the message is that even if you're caught, there's a three in four chance you're not going to be uh, proceeded against. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um... I think one point to, to be clear on with the data that appears in the report is that there is a use of different terminology uh, throughout it. And that you'll see, for example, that there is reference to instance being reported, for example, being reported to the police. Not every instance that is reported will, on further investigation, cause suspicion amongst the police. And insofar as the police have a suspicion, it's not always the case that they will be in a position to have a case which, with corroborated evidence, they feel that they can actually report to the Procurator Fiscal. If, that, if, they, if they pass that hurdle, the Procurator Fiscal themselves may not feel that the evidence is strong enough to actually take into court. And finally, when a case does go into court, then cases are sometimes, they do result in acquittals. So I think what I would say about the data, that's the first thing I would say about the, the data uh, that because of the nature of it, because it comes from uh, various different bodies, that has to be borne in mind that we're not always looking at exactly the same thing when we talk about uh, cases or crimes or incidents. The other thing I would say is that wildlife crime does present certain mm, special issues which don't appear in other forms of crime. And I think this has been recognised for, for some time now. In 2008, I think there was a joint inquiry which was led by the Police Inspectorate and by the Crown Inspectorate of Prosecution. And one of the issues that was identified, first of all, was the legislation which was subsequently addressed significantly by the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act. But another factor that was raised by them was the, the, the sheer difficulty which is raised by crimes that are committed so far out into the, the countryside where there is a real problem with gathering evidence. And if you compare the experience of uh, crime in urban environments, where there are always 
by definition, going to be a, a much larger supply of potential witnesses. And as, as, a, uh, as a result of that, then a much greater scope for uh, data gathering. Those advantages uh, that the system has in terms of uh, fighting crime don't apply in wildlife crime. So there are, there are issues that are presented in wildlife crime that don't appear in other sorts of crime. What I would say is, though, that um, steps have been proactively taken since the, that inspectorate report came out to make sure that wildlife crime is tackled and tackled effectively. And certainly within the Crown Office, there is a, a team of specialised prosecutors who deal, in addition to environmental crime, also with wildlife crime. And they're sectioned, they're ring-fenced effectively from other forms of crime so that they can focus on that and build up a, a stock of expertise. So I agree with you that if the, if the figures are looked at in black and white and if they're looked at in, in very bare terms, then they, they do give some cause for concern. I certainly wouldn't claim to be complacent, and I don't think anyone who's dealing with wildlife crime uh, is. But one thing I would say is that the, the issue is being addressed proactively. It's, uh, it's a high priority for the Crown. I know it's a high priority for the police, and we do have a great deal of assistance from other partners through the, um, the PAUSE network. I don't know if that assists. Mm. Mr Graham, your view? Yeah, I, would, I would echo in some respects uh, what, what Patrick has said, that um, different types of wildlife crime have different levels of success in terms of us detecting who the offenders are. So crimes that are reported to the police uh, at the point where there's an offender present um, more frequently, things like uh, fish poaching, some of the uh, offences against salmon or trout being unlawfully obtained, I've got a far far higher solvency rate than some of the uh, crimes that we would perhaps either proactively identify or be reported to us, such as crimes against wild birds, where it's very rare that those crimes are identified whilst they are taking place. Uh, and it's very rare that anyone makes a report to the police identifying an offender uh, or indeed giving any clue towards the identity of the offender. And our experience is that our ability to detect those crimes is therefore lessened. I, I would also echo the comments that our both commitment um, but ability uh, technically um, and through investigative means to detect crimes continues to improve. So we have brought to bear uh, a number of techniques to wildlife crime investigation uh, which have been generated through other types of police investigation into serious crime, uh, and we're now deploying those routinely into wildlife crime. So looking at uh, forensic examinations uh, at the point that we recover any evidence, uh, whether that be a, a wild animal or uh, a crime scene, and applying the same crime scene forensic protocols that we would apply to other serious crimes, uh, has started to yield a different level of evidence than would have been the case uh, in the past. We are looking increasingly at the use of uh, intelligence, uh, which has been very successful in detecting other serious or organised crime. And again, uh, we hope that that will yield some improvement in our ability to detect offenders, uh, which I think is the, the point that you're making. Uh, and then finally, uh, looking at any other technical means that we can use uh, legitimately to identify uh, offenders uh, and indeed to identify crimes um, so that we can hope that the, the number of detections uh, and perhaps relating back to the, the first question, the number of crimes that we identify if indeed those crimes are happening and they're not being recorded would increase. So, so if I may convene us, so can we be optimistic that in the years to come, as the wildlife reports come forward, we're going to see an improvement in these figures? Well, I think that goes back to the, uh, the kind of previous questions. It, it depends what an improvement means. I, I think we'll certainly see an improvement in the quality of the data, uh, because as I said in relation to the first question, I think we've got some way to go uh, in terms of the comparability uh, and the consistency of the data has been provided by different organisations. And, and as has already been referred to, we've put some plans in place to, to make sure that we do that 
in good time uh, for next year's reporting period. In terms of improving figures, if that means a reduction in crimes recorded or an increase in crimes recorded, we would need to be more specific, I think, uh, in, in the different crime types. I, I think we would need to specify some of the areas where perhaps we think it's most likely that crimes are being under-recorded, and, and I think those are the areas where... Um, we would have to either proactively go out and seek them or other organisations are more likely to put more resource towards proactively finding out about crimes and those figures are likely to go up perhaps um, but there are quite a number of other areas where, where that won't be the case and they're perhaps likely to be consistent. I think, sorry, Commander, I think I was more referring to, to the, the figures that I highlighted at the start because while accepting all the caveats that, that both of you have put to, to these figures the fact is that in a lot of other areas of recorded crime, uh, 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 essentially a proceedings uh, percentage rate of 23 per cent would not be regarded as being very successful. What I'm getting at is can we look forward to, to seeing some evidence in years to come where it would appear that there is a, a greater success in detecting wildlife crime, accepting all the difficulties that you face with that, and a message being sent out that if it's detected, it's going to be punished and punished hard. Hmm. I am optimistic uh, that over the course of the next years there will be an improvement across the board in terms of the detection of crime and in terms of the prosecution of crime. One thing I would say is though that, as I say, it is a high priority. Uh, the prosecutors who are dealing with this crime are specialists. All of them have years of experience. They participate in training courses. This is, apart from environmental crime, which has a certain, to some extent an overlap with it, this is the only kind of work that they do. They have built up an expertise in it, and they do get good results in court. I appreciate that um, more cases, I would expect to see more cases being taken up, and I would expect to see um, more convictions being secured, but I, I think I should add one caveat to that, which is this, that from the Crown's point of view, an acquittal isn't seen as a loss. The Crown doesn't consider itself as winning cases or losing cases. We put evidence into court because we believe that there is a, a justified basis for seeking a conviction. We put the evidence into court and we try to persuade the court that that is in the public interest. But all any conviction in this country has to be returned because the court is satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. And there are some cases that go into court where the court quite simply is not satisfied of that. And that is not necessarily the wrong answer because to be candid, Evidence can look very persuasive in one direction at the start of a case when it's in black and white and it's on paper. What, but when a person is actually in court and is being asked, are you sure about this, are you sure about that, sometimes people do make mistakes. So insofar as, insofar, I appreciate what you're saying that you want to see uh, more evidence, um, sorry, a, a more evidence uh, base for, uh, for success in, the, in these matters, and I would agree with that, and I am optimistic that that will be shown in upcoming years. And, um, but I simply wanted to make clear that the simple fact that an acquittal is recorded in the case, from our point of view, would not be seen as, as uh, necessarily a negative outcome. Thank you. Uh, supplementary from Dave Thompson. Yes. Yeah, thank you, convener, and uh, just a, a very quick one. Um, I know that you're all busy people, the, the police service is busy, the procurator fiscal service is busy and so on, and uh, I've had some experience myself in the past. I spent many years as a trading standards officer, um, and you know I've had experience of cases going in which were very sound cases and they were sent back to a smart no proceedings. And I suspect some of the reasons for that were that they were often very complicated cases and uh, also, um, with the PF service in particular being so busy, it was sometimes, I believe, um, maybe easier for these things to be pushed aside because there's huge pressure on your fiscals across the country. Um, now, you, you've partly answered the question. I think, uh, Mr Hughes, you mentioned it was a high priority crime, this, and Mr Graham, that you classified it along with other serious crimes, I think, when you were, you were speaking. But these crimes are very difficult to detect and very difficult to prove. Therefore, I'm, I would just wonder, um, does that warrant you um, taking a more positive view generally when these sort of cases come before you, either from the police's reporting point of view or indeed, you know, when it gets to the procurator fiscal, that they're not just 
looked at on the round, but it's recognised that because of the difficulty of detecting these crimes and proving them, that an extra effort should be made to ensure that they come before the court. Yeah. Um, if I can answer that really in, in two phases. First, I, w I do want to stress that these crimes, they are treated as a priority. The prosecutors uh, who deal with them are passionate about securing outcomes that are in the public interest. Uh, please, um, I'm not sure, frankly, uh, what, uh, what previous experience you may have had with cases that perhaps ought to have been taken up but weren't. One thing I can assure this committee of is that there is no question of cases being discontinued or not being taken up because of lack of prosecutorial resources. That simply doesn't happen. Uh, these cases where they can be taken up, then they are, and where that case can be pursued to a final outcome in the court, then that does happen, and I'd like to be very clear on that. In terms of the other uh, question that you asked, uh, are we conscious of an extra effort that can be made? I think that extra effort actually is already being made, and I do think that there's great value that comes to us and to the police as well from our, our participation in the Partnership Against Wildlife Crime in Scotland. We are busy, as you say, and there is a temptation to focus on the things that have come through the door and that have landed on your desk. But the, the task for us, I think, as a unit and as, actually as a justice system as well, is to keep the bigger picture in focus. And one thing, certainly, that we benefit from in going along to the pause meetings is that we engage with other stakeholders in this field who convey to us what interests they have, what things they think should be a matter of priority uh, for us, if there's a feel, if there's, um, I'm conscious of one particular area where there's, there's real concern to make sure that the criminal law is, is apt to, to deal with it, and that was conveyed through pause. And again, through pause, um, we've learned that we can make better use of forensic techniques in ensuring that issues with uh, cases that we've had in the past don't arise in the future. So I would say that the, the extra effort is already being made and is producing results. Yes, uh, Robbie Allen. Yeah, from a, from a, an investigator and a, a police officer, some of the experiences you've had, I've probably had as well during my police service, what I would say is the difference with wildlife crime is now that we've got one dedicated unit within Crown, that the wildlife crime investigators throughout Scotland have got one place that they can go to for advice, for consultation, for support. That's allowing us to get, and, and all, we all meet together as an enforcement group as well, and it allows us to share the good practice to ensure that how a case, a case is built in relation to certain types of offences, what worked in this area, what worked in that area, and you're always getting a one consistent voice back. You're not getting different procurator fiscals with different interpretations sometimes, or one with a bigger, bigger workload than another. What you're now starting to get is this consistency. Hopefully it'll be a consistency of investigation, and as, as we improve those investigations as we go, and a consistent message coming back from the Crown in relation to what it is they're looking for to secure those convictions that we're looking for. I think you used the term, uh, you know, could we take a more positive view? I, I think we take a very positive view towards the status of the investigations within the context of a wide range of priorities that the police are responsible for across Scotland. Um, and therefore, we, we do take specific measures. And it's not to say that wildlife crime investigation is a priority that outstrips all others. Uh, that wouldn't be the case at all. But there are very specific structures um, and there is a specific focus on the wild crime inquiries, which has had good results. Uh, and I'm happy to share some of the figures which I brought along in terms of people that are detected, because I think it's important that um, whilst we would seek to report people to the Crown with a view to there being a prosecution, there are other things that can result from us identifying who the perpetrators are in terms of prevention efforts uh, and the wider prevention work that we're trying to carry out to try and reduce the overall number of these crimes happening. So the five-year average um, for up until 2013-14 of overall wildlife crimes being detected is 58% which uh, in comparison with many other crime types is very high. Uh, and for this year to date, uh, that is sitting at 66%. So that, that's actually a, 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 a fairly high overall detection rate when compared against a large number of other uh, crimes in Scotland. And whilst clearly we could do more, um, I think it is a positive endorsement of all of the efforts we're taking to identify who's committing these crimes. That's very encouraging. Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson. 
it, it, thank you, Convener. It is encouraging, and it, it, it's very reassuring to get that, uh, that those responses to Mr. Thompson's question, which, if he likes to look ahead in his papers, he might realise would have been asked by me a little bit later. Um, but that's by that's in, <laughs> that's entirely yeah. You often do, Mr. Thompson. That's that's by the by. What, what my, my question really is, given that re very reassuring evidence and answers you've just given, is why, and it's really to, to the Crown Office um, Procurator Fiscal Service, why therefore in the last two years, certainly, uh, are around a fifth of the cases that are reported by Police Scotland marked for no further action. Um, I, I'm particularly reassured by the fact you said you, you, you are not interested in just getting convictions. You know that you know, it's not some league table or, or percentages of, of gains against losses. So that, that almost increases the validity of my question. Why c c Can you expand on that? Why 20% are marked for no further action? Essentially, uh, cases can be marked for no further action for a number of different reasons. In the table that was produced uh, this year and also the one that was produced last year, they're both in the same format, you'll see that there are figures for cases that were marked for no further proceedings or, or no proceedings more accurately. And then there's a figure uh, in brackets uh, next to that which represents the cases where there was no prosecutorial uh, discretion in that uh, matter. I think this year there are, in fact, fewer cases where prosecutorial discretion was exercised in terms of, um, in terms of not taking up the matter. There were two matters, uh, I think, in 2013 where, the prosec where a case could have been taken up but the Crown exercised its, its uh, discretion not to do so. Both of those uh, decisions were made in the overall circumstances of the, the case and also the offenders. In, in one case, uh, the, the accused person had significant mental health difficulties and also had um, uh, other criminal um, proceedings pending against them, which were going to inevitably result in a much heavier sentence than he was going to receive for this one. So in the cases where uh, prosecutorial discretion is exercised not to take up a case, that's done taking into account all the factors and effectively carrying a balancing exercise. But you'll see that the bulk of cases are cases where there's no prosecutorial discretion, which is a situation that when a case arrives, it's simply not uh, possible uh, for the case to be taken into court. There are a number of reasons uh, for that, and I think the, there is, uh, they're listed actually in the, in the report. But the most frequent ones, uh, sorry, the most frequent ones are cases which are time barred. There are strict time bars uh, for proceedings to be put into court. And sometimes those time bars are simply either the either the case isn't received, either the case is actually received after time bar, or it's not received close enough to time bar to competently put it into court. The other issue is insufficient evidence. Um, and one thing I would like to say about that is in, uh, the sufficiency of evidence is is a difficult question. It's a question which not only um, the prosecutors and not only the reporting agencies, but actually the courts themselves uh, find quite a difficult one. If you look at the appeal court uh, decisions, you'll see that a large number of appeal court decisions are where judges in the lower courts uh, are being assessed. Uh, their assessment of sufficiency is being reassessed by the appeal court. And sometimes it's, um, it's found that the initial court has mischaracterised sufficiency of evidence. In most wildlife crimes, not all, but in most, there is a requirement for corroboration. The corroboration, in its, uh, in its truest sense, can come uh, from two sources. One of those sources can be circumstantial evidence. What will constitute corroboration uh, in one from one case to the next isn't always clear. And in some cases, you won't actually know until you're in court whether or not the corroboration that you have is what you think you have. But another factor, and it's a big factor, I would say, with wildlife crimes, is that the way that they initially look on further investigation, it may, you may think that you have a, a wildlife crime, but because of the various caveats that surround wildlife, various forms of wildlife crime and the various exceptions that apply to them, it may be that on a further investigation, then you, it, it turns out that either there isn't a crime at all or alternatively that there is insufficient evidence to actually take the case into court. And so all of these decisions are being made in a in a relatively short amount of time, I mean, the, the reporting agencies, who aren't just the, the police, but also the SSPCA and, and other agencies, they investigate crime and they are keen to get the cases to us as quickly as possible. So an assessment has to be formed by them at a very early stage. And then it has to be uh, provided to us. That assessment is not always borne out, or even if it initially looks as if it is borne out, 
Further investigation that is done to make sure the case is as strong as it can be before it goes to court sometimes indicates that there simply isn't a sufficiency of evidence. So that's, that, that would be the explanation for the, the no take up rate. And could I, could I just very briefly, uh, uh, I mean, thank you for that detailed explanation. Is, is that a similar percentage to other forms of crime, or is, is, is there some reason for an exception in the case of wildlife crime? Um, the short answer is today I can't actually say that. I, I haven't uh, conducted an analysis of our statistics against uh, the broader COPFS, and I should add the caveat as well. I think I can answer that question probably in writing, um, but not today. Um, the statistics that were pre uh, prepared for this annual report are very much they're, they're unique. No other unit actually does them because of the no other unit I think is subject to the same reporting requirements. So there won't be uh, an immediate readover from our statistics to everyone else's. But in terms of the the no take up rate, I think that is something that can be clarified. I can't say today whether or not it's um, at the same level, greater or lower. Um, if there is a divergence, um, I would again point out simply that wildlife crime is subject to. Uh, to a large number of exceptions and, and different characteristics that don't apply in a lot of other criminal law. One of the big things with wildlife crime is that a lot of wildlife activities actually aren't crimes at certain times or if certain conditions are met. Whereas if you, if you compare that with like crimes against property, uh, crimes of violence, these are always crimes. I mean, if you, if you looked at the, the Code of Hammurabi from Babylon, they would have been crimes then. But the wildlife crimes that we have they're, um, they're criminal. Sometimes um, acts can come in and out of a criminal category. If you see what I mean. But I'll certainly I'll make a note to uh, provide that information to the committee. Right. Yes. That would you know, be useful. Yeah. Be very helpful indeed. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Um, brief question about the time bar. Yeah. Yeah, uh, j just for the purposes of clarity, Mr. Hughes, when you talked about time bar quite often being a factor, is the time bar on wildlife crime or some instances of wild crime different to other crimes? And if it's not, could you explain why it's a factor there and not with others? Um, to be honest, a, wildlife crime is based almost entirely on statute, and most statutes have their own uh, time bars. So the time bar generally, oh sorry, the time bar can vary uh, depending on what statutory offence you're dealing with. Most of the offences that we're dealing with have a six-month time bar. So that basically means that a, the case has to be got. In, um, sorry, I'll, I'll qualify that. What that means is that a citation must be served on the accused within that six-month period. That will be deemed to be commencement of the proceedings. One of the, the big, um, one of the most important uh, provisions that we prosecute under is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, particularly in terms of wild birds. In that act, although not in others, there is a, effectively a saving provision, which will mean that normally, I should say, um, to make this clear, normally the six months runs from the date of the offence. With the, wild, sorry, with the Wildlife and Countryside Act, because of the nature of wildlife uh, crime, the six-month time bar can be certified to run from the period where the prosecutor considers that he or she has enough evidence. So essentially what that would mean is that for some cases, the, the case can land uh, with the, the Crown and more than six months will pass, but investigations are still being instructed. So there's still scope because of that certificate procedure there's still scope for a case to be followed up, and that's particularly useful with DNA cases. Um, I'm thinking of one particular case. It's actually not a wildlife crime, but it, it is uh, it's animal welfare, which is uh, another matter which our unit deals with, although not quite in the same way. DNA analysis, um, it, it has been the case in the past that criminal offences are committed, and initially, for various reasons, there's simply no prospect of a, of a conviction because of a lack of evidence. But subsequently, DNA analysis is conducted, which gives you that sufficiency. Now, with the saving provision that features in the Wildlife and Countryside Act, a prosecution is still competent. In other statutes, it's not because they don't they have a, a, a rigid six-month time bar. So to answer your question, um, there's a general time bar of six months with uh, a limited exception for the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Uh, good, good morning to, to you all, and could I just take you back as, as a panel, if any of you have any further comments on uh, the present status and possible changes to um, corroboration, which may or may not be appropriate for you in your roles, um, in your professional roles to comment on, but particularly in relation to um, the remoteness of um, much wildlife crime and and whether, in terms of the armory for evidence, whether whether any changes might be helpful. 
Well, I'm very happy to, to offer a view. I mean, I'll caveat it from the start to say that I've spent quite a lot of time uh, discussing this or providing evidence to uh, another committee in the Scottish Parliament uh, going back some time on a number of occasions in relation to the proposals in the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. So uh, I guess the position of Police Scotland is, is on record uh, that we would support um, the, uh, the changes that were proposed to the law of corroboration uh, and we laid out a large number of cases where uh, we felt that that would provide a more balanced uh, uh, ability to assess evidence uh, and, and allow access to justice for individuals in certain crime types. Wildlife crime cases were not uh, ones that we used uh, in those particular cases. Um, and uh, I haven't thought in great detail uh, about the nature of the specific laws round about wildlife crime and, and whether that would or wouldn't be uh, of particular uh, assistance balanced against all of the information that we provided, which I think demonstrated that we understood very carefully um, the position that there needed to be safeguards in place to ensure that when evidence was presented to court, it, it would be viewed uh, in, in a balanced way, recognising all the rights that people that are accused of crimes have. So uh, th that is quite a long way of saying, I think, that I would probably uh, be uh, reserved in offering a strong view uh, in relation specifically to wildlife offences without having the opportunity of, of looking in more detail about the, the essential facts uh, that would be required to be proved for each of those offences uh, and how that's laid out in statute before I would uh, I would come to a position on that but I would be happy um, if it was useful to the committee to to consider that and write in uh, in due course thank you um, we're trying to get to grips with something that I think we'll be looking at every year so uh, getting good grounding in this is what you're helping us do uh, just now and helping the public to understand us better um, Turning to raptor crimes uh, and additional measures that have been uh, brought forward, um, we know that uh, some changes were proposed uh, in 2013, including uh, the restriction on the use of general licences, perhaps a review of wildlife crime penalties, uh, establishing if the act is a sufficient deterrent, the encouragement of law enforcement to use all investigative tools uh, for their investigations supported by the Lord Advocate. Um, do uh, Police Scotland already have evidence of s offences that uh, might fall into this category, which have occurred since the 1st of January 2014? And have you passed that information to Scottish Natural Heritage? very much involved in the consultation with Scottish National Heritage about how this process will work around the restrictions in general licences. The first meeting, we've set up a structure where we're going to meet them on a monthly basis. At that meeting, Police Scotland will inform and notify them of any crimes that fit within the criteria as set out within the, the, the proposal, and they will thereafter take that information and make their assessment on, on, on what we give them. The first meeting is the first week in November, and that the first one will go back retrospectively to all offences since the 1st of January. So that process is now in place. Obviously, it's not for, for the police to determine whether they fit within the criteria that SNH would use for the restriction. But what we do have is a process in place whereby that information, and I, I've signed the, the information sharing protocol with the SNH in order to allow for that information to, to, to go across. OK. Uh, I'm, I wonder if, um, you know, uh, we uh, can get any further details about the review of wildlife crime penalties, if there's been any discussion about those. form part of that that that, that, that review com committee that in fact the last meeting was was last week and I, and I think it's at a very early stage in that and, and there are, is a report uh, to, to be with the with the, with the minister within certain uh, time scales as I say it's still very much at consultation phase uh, and a number of measures a number of uh, different aspects of that are being considered at the moment so it's probably not appropriate maybe to, to try and pre or to, for me to try and preempt what's going to come out of that. But suffice to say, both ourselves and Crown are very much involved in that process. Okay. Um, 
thinking about a statement that Police Scotland has made. Uh, Police Scotland will use the appropriate investigative tools at their disposal to investigate crime scenes. Uh, what does this mean? You know, does it specifically include, for example, the admissibility of video evidence in Scotland? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's probably two sides to that uh, question, I think, um, if I could convene. The, the, the first is our overall approach to how we would assess scenes and how we would conduct investigations, which I, I would ask... Uh, DCS Allen to provide some detail on the, the developments um, which I referred to earlier, trying to bring all the best practice and, and good practice that we have from, from other types of crime and, and some specific measures for wildlife crime. And then I think there's a specific issue around about the use of uh, video evidence, um, and, and I will cover that. Um, I think there's been some discussion ongoing about video evidence and how it might be obtained. I need to be clear that if, if the police are going to uh, obtain any video evidence, then uh, if it's going to come from a, a specific uh, directed camera, then that would be covered by the uh, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act. Um, as a public authority, Police Scotland uh, are required to take cognizance of the Human Rights Act in terms of the intrusion um, that any such activity would have into individuals' lives, and not just an individual that we might be specifically targeting. That means that the, uh, the requirements within the, the European Convention, then, uh, in terms of individuals' human rights, are codified uh, through that domestic legislation, uh, and the police uh, are required to authorise such activity in a way that is later uh, inspected, um, through the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner uh, on a regular basis and, and scrutinised very heavily, and, and I should say quite rightly so, um, because these tactics uh, do potentially have the, uh, the ability to intrude into uh, people's private lives uh, and indeed to intrude collaterally uh, into other people uh, where information might be gathered. The, the test um, that is used in authorising uh, such uh, techniques from the police uh, is one of proportionality and necessity, uh, and that is laid out in law. And the authorisation levels for such activity varies, um, but uh, that would go from a superintendent as a minimum level um, for what are deemed to be the least intrusive uh, tactics up to a chief constable uh, or indeed beyond in some circumstances. And uh, in these cases, um, there are very careful considerations uh, around about proportionality, looking at the nature of the crime, the impact of that crime, how serious an impact it has, uh, and that is often assessed as an impact on an individual in terms of violence, in terms of the impact uh, it would have on an individual's life. But there is also an assessment round about uh, economic and social impact uh, and necessity um, is a test based on uh, the uh, availability of other means to investigate that crime uh, and how those other means have perhaps already been used or exhausted in those particular circumstances uh, or in other uh, analogous circumstances. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that uh, there are some very stringent tests to be met before such tactics should be deployed. I think it's quite right that that is the case and therefore it won't be the case that the police will routinely be deploying this type of tactic uh, to wildlife crime investigations. That's not to say that I would rule it out uh, in any circumstances, um, but it is less likely that that test will be met, uh, or those tests that I've laid out will be met uh, in many of the crimes that we're dealing with. Now, there are circumstances where other organisations uh, have gathered uh, video evidence um, and that has come to our attention. And the admissibility of that in court is a matter for the Crown to consider, um, but I would have a concern if it was to come to our attention that organisations were specifically um, seeking to use video evidence to uh, capture the identification of perpetrators of wildlife crime, etc. Uh, and as a public authority, we wouldn't be in a position to endorse that. Of course, there are a whole variety of other reasons why CCTV cameras are set up in relation to um, monitoring premises or, or monitoring sites, uh, and from time to time they might capture evidence of crimes which could then be used, and, and that is the case. So I hope that, that, that covers some of the issues around about the, the, the use of technical evidence.
was about to ask you about the difference between what you've described and CCTV. Um, but, uh, you know, we obviously can see that it is far more stringent uh, uh, relationships. But I want to ask a little more about uh, filming and so on. Um, First of all, Graham Day. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Just a point of clarity. Um, if if a, a member of the public on their phone filmed an assault, serious assault in the street, that's obviously something that would assist the police in their inquiries. If, if a farmer is out on his land and he, he sees hair coursing taking uh, uh, a part, people take part in hair coursing, we, and filmed it on his camera, is that something that could be used by the police? Is that something that would be used as evidence or, or considered as evidence by the uh, prosecution service? Yes, absolutely, is the, is the answer to that. And it's, it's a very different set of circumstances than setting out to proactively film um, covertly um, either a specific area or a specific individual without their knowledge. Um, and that's why it's deemed to be very different in the law. I don't know if the Crown would yeah, wish to offer a, a view. That the example that you've just given uh, presents really no evidential difficulties at all. The farmer is entirely within his own rights because he's, he's on his own land. He's using a camera to, to capture something that he himself is, is seeing and he can actually speak to that, that evidence in court in due course. A difficulty can arise when people are on someone else's land. And as you know, access to land is possible in terms of Scotland, but that is really a matter of statutory right. The, the statute makes quite clear on what basis you can be on someone else's land. And it's important, therefore, that if, the, if you gather evidence uh, or if evidence comes into your possession, it's important that uh, your own position and the, the basis on which you're on that land uh, should be in accordance with the terms of the statute. If that weren't the case, then... The answer depends, again, on the circumstances. Um, Scots law doesn't have a, a rigid exclusionary principle. The, you may sometimes hear an expression called the fruit of the poison tree, which is an American, or at least it was, an American doctrine, whereby if there had been some illegality which uh, produced evidence, then any evidence which was produced by that would be out completely, and there was no possibility of introducing it. Scots law has never taken that approach and adopts uh, a balancing exercise again, which will take into account all circumstances. The first question would be, is evidence regularly obtained or is it irregularly obtained? The, um, the example that you've just given me would be an example of regularly obtained evidence and evidence which has been used by the police under RIPSA, again, is regularly obtained. There's no need to justify that. Irregular, sorry, if evidence is irregularly obtained, then it may be that that irregularity can be justified. But again, it may be that it can't. And I would join uh, with Malcolm's comments that there can't be no endorsement of, of any uh, course of conduct uh, of the matter that, of the, in the manner that he's described of trying to circumvent uh, the provisions of RIPSA. I mean, I should be clear as well, RIPSA only applies to public authorities like the police. So they, for, for our purposes, they are the only reporting agency that are in a position to, to use it. Okay, thank you, that's useful. Indeed. Um, we're interested, I think, uh, Claudia Beamish with a question now on uh, resources for Police Scotland and the Crown <coughs> Procurator Fiscal Service. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it, it, the, the first part of that is some um, question for the police. Um, and it, it's about, uh, if, if I'm right in understanding this, the police um, didn't follow the Crown Prosecution um, Service um, in having one unit dealing with um, wildlife crime um, and the wildlife crime officers um, obviously need to be spread throughout Scotland but is, there, is that correct and is there a reason for that um, decision although there is you know, obviously Police Scotland now? I'll, I'll ask DCS Allen to um, provide some detail about the structure that is in place now and, and why but at a very broad level we don't have a national unit in Scotland. There is a national wildlife crime unit for the UK, which is based in Scotland, um, which we are a big part of supporting, uh, and the Scottish Government supports very clearly in Scotland, and, and we work very closely with them. But we have a national structure for Police Scotland, and that is led by DCS Allen, but it is deliberately uh, decentralised into local policing divisions because we believe that that is the best way of delivering what we're seeking to achieve in terms of wildlife crime. Uh, I'll ask uh, DCS Allen to explain the, the nature of that and, and how it works. Yeah, the, the structure that sits underneath me now is that, that, that we do have this, that this link directly into each of the, the divisions, the 14 divisions, and there are two links in, one at, 
a management strategic level, at the t at chief inspector, superintendent level, who, who's a lead within the, the division. And then you've got a wildlife crime liaison officer within each of the divisions as well, five of which are full-time uh, and the others are not full-time, but they still perform that role within the division. What we also have is a national coordinator who sits working for myself as well. So that way we, we believe that we've got that national coordination, but we've actually got the solutions being delivered and the investigations being delivered locally, which is where the best best place to be undertaken. But those investigators within the divisions have got easy access to some of the more specialist techniques and some of the advice and guidance that they may need, some other forms of support out with uh, out with their division, that that can be provided to them very, very easily. But that overarching governance structure, we believe, because of the geography of Scotland, we, we believe there's, for us to have a, a closed, tight a task force or a small unit, I don't think that would provide us with the coverage and, and that kind of that, that local a, accountability and that local a, a focus that needs to be around about some of these crimes. So that's the structure that we believe is, is the best structure for wildlife crime in Scotland. Thank you. That, that's um, a helpful clarification. And uh, of those um, that are part-time, would you be able to say or to let us know um, in writing what proportion of their time is spent as wildlife crime officers or, or not? And um, how does the resourcing at, the, at present compare to what it was before the formation of Police Scotland? A wildlife crime liaison officer on each of the legacy forces, so you would have an eight of them. Again, not all full-time, some part-time, some not. We, we can certainly speak to those that are not full-time and, and establish how much of their time is taken up with their duties around about wildlife crime. I've n what I would say to you is that they basically do what needs to be done as part of that role. I meet with them quarterly, constant communication through the, the coordinator with them, and never has any of them said that they are not in a position to do the work that needs to be done as part of that role. So what, what I would say is I'm quite happy that what they're having to do is commensurate with their role. On top of that liaison structure, we've got 110 officers within Scotland who have received... I, I would admit various degrees of training around about wildlife crime and those are the ones that sit in support of the liaison officers in each of the 14 divisions and those are the ones that we would go to in first instance around about some of the wildlife crime investigations. We're going to do a bit of work around about uh, putting some structure around about the training that they, they receive as well and, and we're at an advanced stage with a, a training course that will be delivered to these uh, officers that are specifically uh, in place for wildlife crime and we think that will help increase the standards of investigation as well. So you've got a coordination structure, a governance structure and we've got dedicated officers, 110 of them in Scotland, that, that, that are the that kind of front line in relation to wildlife crime. Important point to, to that as well. I mean, there has been a focus on the structure and, and understandably so, because a lot of these people are, are dedicated to either conducting, but in most cases, coordinating uh, our ability as an organisation to uh, adequately um, uh, improve our response to in, uh, investigating and preventing wildlife crime. But the important part is we are not focusing all of our attention on, even if you added up everyone that has just been spoken about, you know, 150 odd people. We've got over 17,234 police officers in Scotland, as, as members of the committee will be well aware. Uh, and the vast majority of the wildlife crimes that are reported, uh, you, you know, perhaps around 300 a year, will be investigated by frontline police officers who are on duty at the time that the crimes are uh, reported to them. In some cases, those inquiries will remain with those officers. In other cases, um, they will be allocated to detective officers uh, to investigate, as with other more complex or serious cases. Uh, and therefore, I'd, I would emphasise that our approach is not to uh, deem the officers who are either dedicated or in, in a part-time role, uh, and my experience would be as a, a substantial proportion of the role that, the, that they are putting towards uh, that, that the, the, the wildlife crime liaison uh, officer role, but we do not deem that uh, our approach is based only on them. We, we would deem that every frontline officer who responds to reports of crime needs to be aware and able to uh, deal with these reports and investigate them thoroughly. And that's an important issue when you look at uh, the spread of crime across the country. Could I just um, very briefly ask you about uh, whether that would be urban as well as, well as rural? Because we haven't talked about urban um, 
wildlife crime. Uh, absolutely, uh, and indeed, um, officers. yeah. Uh, well, while, whilst we haven't been explicit, um, uh, I haven't specifically spoken about rural. Um, I have taken it as meaning that we are uh, talking about urban and rural. There are different types of wildlife crime in all of the divisions uh, across Police Scotland. Many of the local policing divisions have both urban and uh, rural areas within them. Uh, and indeed, there are some types of wildlife crime that are uh, perhaps more likely to be detected or to occur within urban areas, uh, and the officers in those areas are more attuned to that. The supplementaries in this just now. First of all, Graham Day, and then Nigel Don. Uh, yes, if I may just expand on that point, I, I guess that then that the, the role of community police officers will be hugely important in that. Not just those who are based in rural areas, but those who are in urban areas, because very often rural crime is committed by people who live in urban areas. So, I would suspect that, that the uh, development of the relationships in the communities that lead to the environment where intelligence is coming forward is quite useful. And I say that representing. Um, Angus, part of the, uh, the old uh, Eastern Division. Uh, I, I, and rowing back from that a little bit, I, I spent a day with the wildlife crime officer in that area, which was hugely informative, and, and coming to terms of the, the difficulties that, that you face in detecting crime. I just wonder, when, with the creation of Police Scotland, what effort went in to taking that experience and best practice in areas like Angus and ensuring that was shared across the whole of Scotland, and also from other areas, obviously? That, that, that was the real focus for the, for the coordinator's role, the, the dedicated one that sits underneath myself within the, the, the kind of central national structure. And what we do is we basically take on, not just from Angus, and I know some of the, the, the instances you're talking about, but from all the, the previous legacy arrangements were in place, partnerships that have been set up, all the different working arrangements, and we're trying to pull all of those together. Obviously, one size doesn't fit all, but there is absolutely merit in finding out what some of the other wildlife liaison officers, wildlife crime officers have done in various areas, picking the good bits and saying that actually works for me, I can do that in my area, I've got a similar group that I can interact with and some, some of that stuff can be done locally and with my role I can then do that kind of national interaction and that in, engagement at, at a more strategic level but those, those local arrangements are absolutely paramount to what we're trying to do and we can share that through the national coordinator role and through the meetings I have with the, the, the wildlife li crime liaison officers on a quarterly basis. So we're definitely picking the best of what's out there. And Nigel Don. Thank you, thank you Vina. And if I, can, if I can just move fractionally north in Angus, and actually Graham Day has the western glens and I have the northern glens in Angus. Um, it, it seems to me that you, you've spoken a lot about intelligence I suspect that if we really want to know what's happening in those areas which concern both of Graham Day and myself, you would need to have police officers on the ground talking to the community on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. It seems to me that's actually a tremendously difficult thing to do, not because it's difficult to talk to people, but because it's very time-consuming. Do you really have the resources in, in those kind of areas? to actually get out there and find out what's going on, rather than responding. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right. It's, uh, it's not a tremendously difficult thing to do to get police officers to go out and speak to people, uh, but quite clearly we can't be doing it everywhere at the same time. I mean, there are people out there doing that in, in your communities. I, I know for a fact there are people doing it in the community that uh, that you represent because we have done a, a specific piece of work around about some intelligence that uh, we did receive um, in, in, in circumstances that in the past have been quite high profile uh, and much of that was received from uh, officers on the ground speaking to those that are working on the land uh, and feeding that back through um, so that we can we can support that. So it is happening um, on the ground. You know, would it happen more if we had more people? Uh, yes, it would, as the as the honest answer to that question. Um, but I think, as we covered earlier in the session, Police Scotland's got a, a wide number of priorities uh, to both uh, focus upon and respond to, uh, and wildlife crime sits amongst them. Uh, and I think it's a, a proportionate response that we put in place uh, to ensure that uh, officers in, in any area uh, are directed towards this type of activity. Just a little tie-up question about um, from Angus Macdonald just now with regard to statistics, and then Dave Thompson. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, convener. Um, before we move on to uh, 
uh, other aspects of the report, I'm, I'm keen to, to briefly explore uh, penalties for wildlife crime. Um, now, uh, the, t taking on board the fact that we're discussing a, a Scottish Government report, um, why does the report not include any information uh, on the penalties for wildlife crime? And is that information freely available and can, could it be included in future reports? Um, I think the short answer is um, I'm not personally entirely uh, clear why that data is not in the report. I think that the data probably can be ascertained uh, from Scottish Government justice analysts. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I'm afraid that that probably doesn't assist too much. Um, I don't know why it's not in the report, but I think it can be obtained, and I think certainly if the committee expressed uh, a desire that it should be obtained, then that can be provided. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's certainly an issue that we can raise with the Minister next week, um, and certainly press him to ensure that it's uh, included in future reports. Thank you. Useful. Um, thank you very much. Now, Dave Thompson. Wiener, uh, I was interested uh, when Mr Hughes mentioned that uh, animal welfare was also one of the responsibilities of, uh, of his unit um, and, and when I was in local government I was responsible for animal health issues in the Highland uh, regional area. I uh, was heavily involved back in 2000, 2001 or thereby on the, with the foot and mouth uh, outbreak for instance and I'm just wondering how much uh, cooperation there is between police and local authority uh, animal health officers. I, I know that not all uh, councils appoint dedicated animal health officers. Some of them designate their um, trading standards officers as also animal health officers and so on. But there are a number of dedicated animal health inspectors. We, we'd, we'd a couple in Highland, for instance, you know. And, and whether the, the dual responsibility in relation to the Animal Health um, Act uh, I mean, every constable is authorised, you know, it's constables that are mentioned in the Act, so constables can enforce anything there. But the, the responsibility of the local authorities, the responsibility of the police, what's the current cooperation? And is there, would there be any merit in having a look at all of this and looking at the responsibilities and possibly consolidating some of those responsibilities? I mean, would it be useful if uh, Police Scotland had the full responsibility for these issues. Um, there is an additional r resource there of uh, animal health officers, some dedicated across Scotland that could fit in fairly well, I would have thought, with what you're doing generally. So I just wondered if there had been any thought about this, any discussion about this, or if there's any merit in having a look at it, if not. I have to say, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's not something that I'd uh, considered before uh, coming here today. The cases that we see are generally reported to us uh, either by, sorry, the animal welfare cases that we see are generally reported to us either by Police Scotland, uh, in fact the majority of them come from the police, um, some of them come from another reporting agency which is the SSPCA. So the, the involvement of the, the animal health inspectors at the local authority takes place at a stage prior to us really becoming involved. And our experience is that the, they generally assist the police and provide evidence and then effectively become witnesses in the case. As to whether or not there's scope for combining the role, I'd like to give that more thought as a short answer. Um, I'm conscious that if I was if I was expressing an opinion about that, it wouldn't be, it would really be on the hoof. And also I don't want to um, to commit any other organisations which, um, which may or may not uh, agree with that. It's not just the welfare issues, there's a broader animal disease issues, you know, that come into this as well. And, um, you know, I mean, I would welcome you giving some thought to this. I don't know if the police have any of that. Uh, likewise, that I'm aware we're involved in any discussions around. Uh, I'm sure it'd be worthy of looking at um, without wishing to, to jump into expressing a view upon it. Um, I would be happy for for that to happen, and 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 perhaps it's something that uh, we could do through the the network that we have, um, the, the the paw network, which we've heard about already. Um, and as a as a general principle, um, we will work closely with any uh, agency or organisation um, that that is going to support the the, the aims of the organisation. So, uh, if that was the case, we'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. So, whether it's uh, 
paws, hoofs or wing. Uh, returning to wildlife crime incidents in uh, 2014, um, Dave Thompson. Yeah, the, the um, particular incident uh, that, that I'm um, interested in, obviously, is the Ross Shire uh, incidents where uh, red kites and buzzards and so on were um, were were killed and uh, i'm particularly interested in the fact that just at the weekend there there were a number of media reports following a, a press statement i think by police scotland um stating that uh, it didn't appear that this was deliberate that it had been accidental um, I mean, obviously, you'll be well aware it's caused a lot of consternation, not just in, in my constituency and, and Rob's, um, but uh, all over Scotland and, and, and more more widely. So I, I just wonder if, if, if you could give us any further information on the statement that was made at the weekend uh, and elaborate on that a wee bit. I'd, I'd welcome that opportunity if I could perhaps uh, provide a bit of clarification uh, and then I'll ask DCS Allen to provide a bit more detail about um, what, what has gone into conducting that investigation. I, I think you said that, uh, that, that the birds hadn't been uh, targeted but it, it had been accidental and, and that certainly wasn't the nature of the press release that we put out. We're very careful to say that um, the assessment was that the birds had not been deliberately targeted um, that had died. That that did not infer that it was necessarily an accident, which would, uh, in my view, take away any um, investigation round about a criminal act, which is not the case. Um, what I think we were trying to do, uh, given the large amount of speculation, uh, much of which I think uh, is not helpful to progressing the investigation, uh, was to try to put out some more information into the public domain which was going to clarify what we thought our best assessment was lay behind the intent of the acts that we're investigating and from everything uh, that we have done in combination with a number of other agencies who are very active in this field and who supported the press release that we put out we wanted to say that it didn't appear that the activity had sought to deliberately target the birds that had been killed. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a criminal act that lies behind um, what has happened. Can I just follow that, Convener? Um, yeah, well, that, that's very interesting. So, uh, in essence, what you're saying is they were kind of collateral damage, I suppose. Uh, but wh wh what kind of evidence do you have um, in relation to what was targeted? Because if, if pest control... Uh, measures were applied and they would have been targeted at something and what you're saying is it wouldn't be the birds um, but uh, you know what, what were what were the targets and what evidence is there that the targets were actually hit I mean I'm, I'm not aware that there was much evidence of of, of uh, other um, birds and other species actually being found in any great numbers anyway you know dead yeah it it is a combination of all of the circumstances um I, I think we are doing our best to try and put out into the public domain as much information as we can about what the findings are. But I'm sure uh, y yourself and members will be aware that it's a very important live investigation uh, and therefore we need to be cautious about the amount of information that we reveal about the findings um, uh, that, that we have gathered as a result of that investigation to date. Uh, and that is why we uh, arrived at the situation where we released the statement that we did. So I'm not able to go into uh, precise detail about all the other findings because I would hope in the future that could still be uh, a part of a case uh, where we to identify the, uh, the perpetrator or perpetrators in the circumstances. And I wouldn't want anything that I would say now um, on, on public record to potentially... Um, in, in some way work against that um, in later proceedings. So I, I, I hope it's been helpful as much as we have been able to put out. Uh, and what I would ask DCS Allen to, uh, to cover in a bit more detail is perhaps some of the, the rigour and scrutiny that's gone into the nature of the investigation, uh, which wouldn't prejudice uh, any, any future proceedings, but will hopefully give some reassurance about how seriously that incident has been treated. <laughs> As Assistant Chief Constable said, we did try to provide some as much information as we can to the public because obviously it's such a high-profile inquiry. There had been 
consistent clamours for more and more information, and unfortunately there had been a lot of unhelpful speculation as well. What I would say in relation to this is, throughout that statement, we still reiterated this is an active criminal investigation. Our previous press releases outlined it was an illegal poison that had been used in this. All we were trying to do was give the public, give everyone concerned, some sort of understanding of what the assessment was of what had happened on this occasion. What I would say about that inquiry is that on at least two separate occasions I've been up in Inverness myself, we've undertaken a full review of that inquiry. Obviously my background is very much from an investigative point of view, not always wildlife crime. And, and as Mr Graham had previously talked about some of the tactics that we are taking from other investigations across into wildlife crime, we adopted some of those within the, the Black Isle inquiry and we undertook a full review of that inquiry and we basically stripped it bare, went through every aspect of the investigative strategy, the media strategy, the forensic strategy that lay underneath this investigation that was being adopted by the senior investigating officer. Also involved in that process were partners, RSPB, SSPCA were at those, uh, at that uh, part of that process where we actually stripped it right back, ensured that we were absolutely attempting to exploit every evidential opportunity that was available to us and thereafter focus and, and, and identify the priorities for that investigation going forward. That is still an ongoing process, that constant review, that constant update depending on available evidence, available witness statements, available intelligence still continues as of now and, and I've still got that oversight of that investigation going forward because it obviously has been the highest profile we've had and uh, highest profile one we've had in 2014. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, follow up a, a little bit more, uh, convener. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been going on for quite some time now, it, it, you know, and as time goes on, obviously, um, you know, it becomes more difficult, I suppose, in, ma in many ways for you to, um, uh, you know, get the evidence you need or, or prove the case or whatever. And, and I mean, th th there are lots of concerns locally. Th as you say, there are lots of um, stories going about, uh, uh, different different rumours about what may have happened. Uh, but real concerns about the time it took, for instance, to um, decide to to, um, you know, enter premises looking for um, evidence and so on and and the particular places that, were, that were, were targeted. I don't know if you can say anything more about that today. Not in relation to specifics. What I would need to, what I would say is, again, as per an investigation, we need to operate under the rules of law. We need to be absolutely certain in our facts and, and what we're doing and that thereafter dictates what we our activity and our investigative strategy, particularly around about searches, etc. Um, the time scale, I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's now or back at the time it happened, it was always going to be a difficult inquiry. It, the circumstances around it made it very, very difficult, as do a number of that type of inquiry. Uh, but what I'm comfortable is that everything that we could have done in relation to that, we have done. The bottom line is we did not have a series of witnesses standing watching that crime happen. What we have is a tragic set of circumstances where 16 birds have, have been poisoned uh, up in that area and we're trying to, to secure some evidence to, to, to find out who was responsible. We've had a great support from all our partners in relation to that. There's a significant reward in place in relation to that to try and get that information, that last piece of the jigsaw that we might need just to pull that case together. But so far, we're as frustrated as anyone that we've not been able to do that. Also, we're as frustrated as anyone round about the, the rumour and speculation, which there's not a lot we can do about that. That's unfortunately the, the, the nature of it. If we put out press releases, there's rumour and speculation. If we don't put out press releases, there's rumour and speculation. That's just the, 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 where we are at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, I'll press you a little further because I think the press release makes it more difficult uh, for us to actually uh, see what's going on here. Because you've said that uh, these 12 red kites and four buzzards were most likely not targeted deliberately, but instead were victims of pest control measures. So, can you elaborate on the phrase pest control measures? What, what I would say is that, that, that what we believe or the assessment is that illegal poison was, was placed in that area and as a result in the death of the, those birds. What we do not believe is that that poison was put there to kill those birds. If, if I may repeat the question that yep. Dave Thompson asked, why were there no crows and other birds found? 
again, that's part of the, the, the kind of expert assessment that we've had from some of our partners to, to say that when we got to that scene, it was exactly the same as it was the day before or the day before that. It's not it, that 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 scene changed over a period of time, and that's not to say has there been any. I mean, I'm speculating here as to has there been some sort of a activity at that scene that, that, that we are not aware of. But on all the circumstances and everything that we've had and we've assessed along with our partners, the assessment was that it was not the birds that were targeted on that occasion. Okay. Um, Graham Day? It, it's, it's a related matter, and, and I, I'd really value the police's opinion on this. The government are talking about introducing a pesticide disposal scheme, essentially an amnesty for that appalling poison carbifurin. From your experience, how much of an assistance to you in doing your job and dealing with wildlife crime would having an opportunity for people to dispose of this terrible uh, poison uh, be? Absolutely. And, and, and probably that's what the Black Isle does show, is that very small amounts of any of these types of illegal poisons have absolutely catastrophic uh, consequences so anything that we can do to get rid of those which and they've been illegal for so long we, we just need to get them out of our society they shouldn't be there uh, so we're fully supportive I'm aware of the of the, of the, the discussions and and, the, and the, the proposals around about that and very much Police Scotland are, are very much uh, on side with that. Uh, there is a practical effect because we know that in cases where we find illegal poisons because of the volume of poisons that are still being stored, i.e. that haven't been disposed of, it's difficult for us to draw a conclusion uh, that would match that to any particular criminal act. We, we can't necessarily draw evidence from that. So there's a practical effect in trying to reduce the amount of the poison that there is out there. But I think, importantly, there's a very strong message that's sent to people to say you have an opportunity to come forward in a way that hasn't been made available to you since the legislation changed and it changed for all the different poisons through different pieces of legislation through time but some of it um, is in some people's eyes relatively recent I think we're going back to acts in 2006-2007 uh, and that poison has lain not being disposed of well this is the big opportunity that people will have and then thereafter I think we're in an even stronger position to redouble our efforts in terms of uh, any consequence that would come uh, and any conclusion that can be drawn from people who would have chosen not to take part in that exercise, which we would be very supportive of. Thank you. Uh, to come back to the, the question about you working with your partners, as you say in the press release, where do you consider the NFUS and uh, Scottish Land and Estates in terms of uh, your partners? I think that they are uh, key partners in terms of the work that we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis in local policing. Uh, I know that they have uh, both spoken publicly and supportively uh, of the efforts that we have made in, in for instance, uh, the inquiry that we've just discussed. Uh, and I know that um, their interests, albeit I think uh, the, the, the Farmers' Union are not specifically represent, represented in the, in the main POG group, uh, their interests are represented uh, within the formal governance uh, and coordination structures that we sit upon. Uh, now, clearly, there are a number of groups um, that at times appear to come with competing interests uh, and sometimes differences of opinion, uh, and the police are a part of that. Um, we are not the people that, uh, in any sense, uh, sit over that. We, we sit alongside that in terms of coordination. And what we would seek to do is to find areas of common interest where we can work together, um, because largely the, uh, the prevention of wildlife crime uh, and the identification of those who commit it is a shared interest that all of these groups have, and everybody has publicly stated that. Jim Hume? Just going back to the, that press release and, and that press article, uh, I think the 25th of October in the press in general, the, the paper itself says that the police found that that the 16 raptors had been killed by banned poisons and, and the police spokeswoman, uh, as you rightly stated, 
said it was, was most likely not targeted deliberately, but instead were the victims of pest control measures. Now, if it's a pest control measure and it's a banned poison, it, that, that's an illegal action. I just wonder if you could really clarify, is the, is the Press and Journal's article correct, saying that it was a banned poison and that it was actually a, a different pest control measure? And what relevance is that? I mean, if a person went out and shot an eagle, for example, and but said, oh, well, I, that wasn't my target. I was actually thought it was a big crow or something like that. Uh, what, what is the relevance of that? Because I, I share the convener's concerns that we're, we're actually muddying the waters even more with the, with the release that's went out and or perhaps the way it's been reported. Uh, I mean, let me provide some clarification then on, on two points. The first is that we're not in any sense trying to de-escalate the seriousness of the criminal acts by trying to provide some information into the public domain that we believe will helpfully avoid the range of speculation which has centred on a number of different bodies and individuals uh, within that area and more widely, which as members will know if you've heard them, most certainly cannot all be true. Uh, and it is not unusual in a set of circumstances like this where there's this level of public interest and, and therefore media reporting that there uh, are a large number of rumours uh, and pieces of information, uh, all of which uh, I'm very clear the police will, will be aware of and all of which we will take seriously and attempt to investigate with the purpose of either establishing if they are true uh, or if they're not, uh, establishing that they're not true, uh, and that can assist with the investigation as well. And that was the reason behind putting the press statement out, because our belief was it would provide some clarification uh, and it would hold some weight in the public domain uh, to steer away from some of the most unhelpful speculation that was directing people towards uh, specific causes of uh, the acts. It wasn't in any sense trying to make out that it was a less serious or a non-criminal act, and I think we were quite specific about it remaining a criminal investigation, uh, and if the, the sense of that has been to in some way deprioritise or, or de-escalate the seriousness, then that absolutely was not intended, and our efforts to resolve the circumstances and, and identify what has happened and by whom continue. And uh, just to, I don't think the question has been fully answered, maybe. Um, specifically, I mean, was it that, because this is the press and journal that state this and, and not, your, not yourself in the release that I can see, perhaps, but was it an actually a banned poison? Uh, that is the one po point that I would still like to clarify. And uh, maybe from the Procurator Fiscal, what, what is the difference if, the, if, it was, if it was a banned po poison, therefore it's an illegal act, no matter what the target is, what difference does does that make then if what the actual if the actual target was perhaps a less protected animal or I, I don't know uh, so it's a clarification on those two points from my previous question Absolutely. an illegal poison and, and that was part of our previous uh, media strategy confirmed that um, how that plays out uh, in relation to any future prosecution would be very much down to the crown um, to answer your question I agree entirely with uh, what the police have said. Uh, there is no question of the criminality of this incident being reduced or being affected by the nature of the release which, is, which has been put out, which gives the police assessment of the evidence available to them at this time. The answer to your question is that it will definitely be a criminal act and it will be the same form of criminal act that was previously, I think, understood to be. The difference will be that the every criminal act it's essentially composed of, of two parts. There's the, the physical act, the committing of the crime, and then there's what's going through the, the mind, the yeah, the mental element, what's going through the mind of the of the accused person at the time that they commit the criminal act. Now criminal um sorry, the, the mental element for this sort of crime can either be intention or it can be recklessness. And the nature of the, the press release indicates that a conviction would be likely to be sought on the basis of recklessness rather than intention. Thank you. Sorry, yep. Okay. Fine. Dave Thompson. Just to follow up on that point, please, convener, if, if I may. Um, so that, that very clearly says to all of us then um, that 
both yourselves and Police Scotland have satisfied yourselves absolutely <clears throat> that it, it, it wasn't a malicious act. And some of the rumours going about, you know, were suggesting that it was something that was done maliciously to, to try and malign other people. So you very clearly, I think, said today that you, you're ruling out, you, you, you've satisfied yourself, you've got enough evidence to show that it wasn't done maliciously, that it was something that was reckless and uh, accidental and reckless, I suppose. Would, would that be a fair summation of what you've said, or do you want to clarify that further? I don't think it is. If I can clarify, I, I, think, I don't think we've satisfied ourselves beyond all doubt, um, and I don't have the wording of the press release in front of me, but we were very careful in the language that we used. It would appear that, that members do. I think the language that we used was very clear in that it was our, our assessment. I don't know if you can remember the exact words... Uh, Robbie, that we, we used. We said most likely. So, again, it, it was a press release to inform. It, it's not... I mean, this, this press release, this wasn't to, us going into a court of law to, to, to provide evidence. This was to try and inform uh, the public in general as to the progress of the inquiry. Um, and it, the one thing we have never... And I know you've mentioned the word accidental a few times. I would. That's the one that I would... Uh, take issue with it, that we've never gone down the line of saying it's accidental. This is a criminal act and it, as the Crown have quite clearly pointed out when we find who's responsible for this th that, that second element of it will be the only bit that's then up for, for debate. This is a criminal act and it's been investigated the same now as it was in day one and we will continue to apply as much resource and commitment as we can to that in order to try and find out who was responsible. of uh, where we find ourselves. So it is not um, that we've satisfied ourselves beyond all doubt and, and the investigation does continue. Can I just uh, perhaps uh, thank you very much for that ex explanations which are very helpful to people out there, uh, especially in the local area who have great concerns. Um, because of the known death rate of red kites in the Black Isle area, since the reintroduction. Do you have historic information about where carcasses were found? Uh, in other words, a mapping exercise. I believe the figure was something like 160 uh, or so red kites, which died in one form or another between 1999 and 2006. And following on from that, you must have a map of where the uh, carcasses were found in these incidents. Is that publicly available? We certainly, for, for every dead red, red kite, Police Scotland will not have that sort of information. I know a number of our partners, and certainly within the Paul Raptor group, that there is a process ongoing round about that mapping of of the various carcasses. So, yes, as part of the Paw the, the Raptor subgroup, yes, it will be. But as far as the police charting or mapping every carcass, no, what we would be doing is, is focusing on those that have been confirmed as being poisoned or, or, or shot, those that have been killed illegally, basically. OK, I mean, I think it's just important to put that on the record at the moment because I'm sure it's something we'll be interested in following up in due course when more of that information becomes available. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, uh, some questions now about one of your partners, the SSPCA. Um, Claudia Beamish want to ask anything about that just now? Or um, anyone else want to take a lead on this one? OK. Uh, Generally, about uh, partnerships, I did just want to ask um, first about in the report, it's actually on page eight that it states that there's some difficulty with um, Poor Scotland um, and their work because of the, um, the uh, and I quote in the first paragraph, finding it increasingly difficult to attend the variety of meetings held throughout the year. And I'm just wondering about whether the communication is it is obviously a challenge without wanting to put words in, in anyone's mouths, but just in terms of those connections and communication uh, for very important uh, issues, whether that's a difficulty. Of the eight PAW groups, we're obviously represented on them. We, we 
chair two previously. I've just recently taken over the chair of the of the Paul Raptor group. So fr from a Police Scotland perspective, we are absolutely fully engaged with that post structure, with that a uh, committee structure, and, and we are active participants in all, all aspects of PAW. Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, convener. Just to um, follow in broadly in relation to the um, SSPCA uh, being given powers, I, I noticed that um, Police Scotland have, have uh, in your submission, um, expressed uh, some concerns uh, about that and uh, raised issues like perceived conflicts of interest. Um, <coughs> I'm just wondering, uh, given that you know resources are scarce uh, overall, uh, it would appear that it might be useful to have them uh, authorised to, to do what, what they need to do to, to help you. But it also raises for me a, a sort of related issue, and that is uh, water bailiffs. Um, now, my experience uh, of water bailiffs back in the, in the 70s, quite some time ago, I would have to say, <clears throat> is that in Lewis, where I was living at the time, there was a lot of a lot of ructions over uh, water bailiffs who had been appointed by estates, and they have very extensive powers. These water bailiffs, as as you'll all appreciate, and there was a lot of conflict locally. Um, I mean, the, these folk, I think, could best be described as, uh, or some of them at least at that time, nothing more than thugs. Um, appointed from uh, uh, out with the Highlands, from the Central Belt, and, and from London, and there was a lot of intimidation of local people went on at the time, and of course there was retaliation as well. And if you want to read about it, just um, have a look at the West Highland Free Press and the Stornoway Gazette uh, at the time. <clears throat> so we have a situation where we have water bailiffs appointed by private people, basically, with extensive powers um, to deal with matters. And indeed, we see from the evidence that there are more crimes detected in relation to salmon and deer and so on than in a lot of the other wild, uh, wildlife areas. So I'm just wondering, what's the difference between giving a respectable organisation like the SSPCA additional powers and strength to help you? Uh, compared to what is ex already there in relation to the powers that uh, water bailiffs uh, and the states have. Okay, th th there's a number of points raised in that uh, wh which I'll try to cover um, in turn. I, I think the, the the principle is that we're very keen to work with SSPCA as partners uh, who bring a lot of expertise and resource uh, to wildlife crime investigation currently. We have made some suggestions where we think their powers could be enhanced. But I think, as you've highlighted by uh, perhaps the anecdote in relation to water bailiffs, from your experience, we would have concerns that the SSPCA are not uh, well equipped as an organisation to take on the nature and strength of the powers uh, that are proposed within the, the consultation. The, the world has changed uh, quite dramatically in a short space of years. Uh, the police, as an investigating agency, when we have powers to interfere with people's lives in any way, whether that is through the seizure of property or whether that is through uh, preventing them uh, from going about their business or being at liberty, uh, are under very strong scrutiny measures and an increasing legislative framework uh, which directs uh, the way in which we do that and the rigorous measures that are put in place to capture and record the way in which that is done. I think the examples that you give of the water bailiffs are probably a very good reason why we wouldn't want to move to anything akin to that in uh, any other organisation. And, and I take the point that you're not making a comparison with the SSPCA, but you'll see from the written response that Police Scotland's put into the consultation that we would have concerns that the same level of scrutiny governance uh, and accountability, both in a day-to-day -day but in an organisational sense that sits over Police Scotland in terms of the use uh, and discretion around about our various powers, uh, the independent scrutiny uh, that comes upon us from how those powers are utilised uh, wouldn't be in place for an organisation like the SSPCA. And we would have concerns about that um, based on all the work that we've done in recent times, whether it's around about 
the way that we conduct ourselves as an organisation, uh, whether it's uh, around about people coming into into custody or where their liberty is, is, is taken from them, i.e. they're not free to go about their movements. Uh, and we've presented some, some cases of, of where that is uh, applicable. And then I think the final point is uh, about the, the overall resource. So you, you, you made a, an, a sort of comparison of some of the crime types that are detected more highly, which can often be uh, not just salmon or sea trout poaching offences, but poaching in general. Um, but it's not exclusive to those areas. Uh, and those areas are not exclusively more likely to be detected because of the presence of, for instance, water bailiffs. They are offences that are more easily detectable than some of the other crimes that we've been talking about because they tend to happen in specific locations that can be more easily targeted. They tend to come to the attention of members of the public more readily, um, as well as perhaps people who are uh, specifically focused on that, for instance, water bailiffs and other types of offences. We've just had a, a, a series of discussions about the events round about Conan Bridge uh, are far less likely to be detected. Uh, and indeed, I don't think that giving the SSPCA additional powers uh, would lend any additional support towards those types of offences being um, uh, either recorded in higher numbers or detected in greater numbers. I think the SSPCA um, suggests that they have uh, around 60 officers who they could put uh, to doing this. Um, I don't think that they are 60 officers who are currently underdeployed or indeed sitting free as additional to this. Uh, and I think in the scheme of some of the commitments that Police Scotland is able to make, the numbers of officers that we have, uh, I don't believe that that, that that outweighs some of the counterbalance uh, in terms of the concerns that we would have if these powers were to uh, to be brought um, to the SSPCA. So we appreciate it's a difference of view. That's something that we have to work through with SSPCA and continue all the good work that we do with them. Um, but it's based on a foundation of principle uh, and our understanding of where we can most constructively and properly work together. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I fully agree with you that the issues of accountability and scrutiny are, are extremely, extremely important, and that would obviously have to be something that would need to be looked at very, very closely if those kind of powers were going to be given to the SSPCA. Did I detect uh, in your answer, however, that uh, you may favour similar accountability and scrutiny being applied to uh, the work of water bailiffs? We haven't looked at that in any great uh, d degree of detail. What, what I would say is that our experience is that the powers that water bailiffs have, and which I think, as you've already highlighted from your own experience, were perhaps used in the past, are now no longer used routinely. We do not have experience of water bailiffs who think that they are in a position to apprehend people. They understand that um, both public perceptions and indeed legal perspectives on uh, people being brought into custody, detained, have changed fairly dramatically. Um, and rightly so, I would argue that the, the scrutiny that needs to be brought to, to bear uh, when somebody is going to be uh, apprehended um, and, and not allowed to go about the business uh, is quite rightly um, far more rigorous than from your experiences in the past. And therefore, our experience is that water bailiffs no longer use those powers. Um, and I, I don't have any experiences of where that has been the case in, in recent times that's come to my attention. No, as modern technology has evolved, use of mobile phones, the, the experience of Police Scotland at the moment is that water bailiffs are much more inclined to contact us and phone us and have the police engaged at a very early stage. Obviously, they're talking about incidents that's happening at water's edge and things like that. So the risk assessment round about them becoming involved as maybe they would have done in the past, that's not our experience of what's happening. The powers are there, and, and you may be right, there may be a, an option to review what those powers look like. Our experience at the moment is they are not being utilised. They're not using the full uh, breadth of the powers that they have. But that's not to say they're not still effective in what they're doing because they involve the police at an early stage. Well, that, that's very interesting um, to, to, to hear that uh, because, as you say, the, the, the powers are still there, but uh, d different methodologies may be being applied at, at the current time. But that's not to say if, they, if someone did want to use those powers, then uh, you know, they, they would be acting legally. Maybe it's something that we need to look at 
as a committee sometime in the future. Um, I think we will be looking at this in terms of the Wild Fisheries Review, which has made some recommendations, but it talks about there only being a need for modest reforms. Uh, I just looked it up just now in the particular recommendations of uh, Andrew Thin, Jane Hope and Michelle Francis. Uh, so we will come to this again. Um, Claudia Beamish on uh, SSPCA. Right, yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Ju just to um, go a bit further forward on that point about the SSPCA in relation to the consultation and the Police Scotland submission. Um, I understand that in your response um, that uh, an alternative was proposed where inspectors could be empowered to seize evidence of wildlife crimes if it was found in the course of their investigations. Um, do correct me if that, I've got that wrong, but that's, that was my understanding. Could, could I ask if that is the case, firstly? And also, um, whether um, at Police Scotland, whether you have any concerns uh, about um, SSP, SSPCA's existing powers in relation to animal health and welfare legislation? No, absolutely not. Current, current powers, and, and when, you, when you look at what they're trying to do around about welfare and, and care of animals, Police Scotland have no concerns around about that. Where we looked at, we, we were trying to be constructive in, in, in what we, we replied in, in, as part of the consultation. And obviously, uh, as uh, Mr. Graham's outlined, that there were points that we believe needed to be made. But th th that proposal was that there is occasions where the SSPCA find themselves in a situation where, quite legitimately, they're doing the right thing. They're in treating welfare, looking at an incident, and it turns into something else. And it, and it seemed to us very sensible to thereafter say, well, actually, as a result of that change in, in the circumstances, could they then be a bit more pragmatic about what they do about that, that incident and be able to extend their powers a little bit to actually physically seize evidence, etc. at that time? Where, where it then becomes difficult is that for the forensic examination of that evidence, etc., that needs to be us. That needs to come to the police. So we need to become involved in that process. But if, by allowing SSPC to take that initial action, that gets that evidence secured at an early stage and, and it gives us an a, additional opportunity to exploit forensic evidence from it. That's actually that's absolutely the right thing to do. Right, thank you. Any other questions about the SSPCA just now? If not, then we'll move on to Nigel Dawn wants to look at vicarious liability. Thank you, convener. I'd like uh, briefly, gentlemen, if I may, to take you to the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011, which may or may not be at the top of your heads, uh, at the top of your minds, but um, that introduced a level of vicarious liability. And looking back on Section 24, it, it seems that it covered both employees and agents and a person providing relevant services. And at the very end, it was an attempt to make sure they didn't matter who actually engaged the person providing those relevant services. All of it designed, of course, to make sure that there weren't ways out for people to say, well, we weren't actually vicariously liable. I'm just wondering, I recognize this is actually relatively recent in, in prosecutorial terms, but I'm wondering whether you can reflect on what that act provided, whether it seems to have covered the ground that you wanted it to cover whether therefore there might be other things that we should be adding to it or just how effective it seems to be as an enforcement of prosecutorial level, please. Um, I agree with you that it, it certainly is early days in terms of the Act. There are two matters in terms of this section which are now in the court system, but both are some way from proceeding to trial. My impression for um, at this stage on the basis of, the, of our experience with it so far is that the, the Act is quite comprehensively drafted and as such is an effective tool and captures uh, a great deal of what are known as special capacities, people who are acting in, a, in the capacity of, uh, of for example, uh, an employee or a person who's providing services. So I have no particular concerns about the wording of the Act just now and I do think that it's fit for purpose. I certainly, at this stage, um, I wouldn't propose any amendments to it. In terms of the effect that it is having, that can really only be judged fully once cases do go to court or resolve um, following uh, procedure. But I would say that in contact with uh, other stakeholders in the course of our uh, PAW meetings, 
it's been very it's been made very clear to me that it is having a big impact. I mean, I think amongst people who envisage themselves or who anticipate that this is something that might affect them, then it is something that responsible people are very concerned about. And I want to stress, I mean, this act has been passed in response to a, a perceived problem. And the perceived problem was that crimes were being committed by employees, but they were either being winked at or, in fact, instructed by people who were up the chain from them. I think that problem does exist. I think that the, the scope of that problem, I certainly would hope that it's relatively limited. But the, the great virtue of the Act it is twofold. First of all, it, it addresses that problem, but it also moves the whole question of protecting wildlife up the priority list for everyone else. I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that people who, who run these businesses are very busy people and they have a lot of calls on their time. But the effect of this act, is certainly my impression from uh, contact through Paul, is that everyone now is extremely conscious of it. Everyone is very conscious of the fact that they have to be proactive and to take steps to make sure that this will never come to their door. So my impression of the act, um, certainly at present, is that it is effective. From our point of view, what obviously in consultation with the Crown, what, what we've tried to do is ensure that an investigation around about vicarious liability is as robust as it, as it can be. And we have had a couple already, and we've tried to share that learning linked in with Crown about how best to build that type of case. But like Patrick on Paul, I, I think there's quite a, a considerable amount of debate goes on around about it and awareness about it. And I, I think if it was set out to, to try and focus the minds of those further up the, the, the chain, it's certainly doing that. Thank you. A supplementary from Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Kabir. I think, I think today's been, from a personal perspective, hugely instructive uh, in terms of giving myself and I'm sure other committee members an understanding of the issues concerned in detecting wildlife crime and, and securing convictions. Uh, but I wonder if Police Scotland can, can maybe enhance that understanding further. From the, the investigations that you carry out into raptor persecution in particular, is there any evidence that in, in some instances the actions have been perpetrated not by estates or landowners or their employees, but by others potentially with a view to besmirching the reputation of estates or the wider uh, sector? Does that sort of thing go on in your experience, and if so, to what extent? I'm aware, I'm, I'm acutely aware that there is a view that that does go on. I'm not aware that we have ever gathered any evidence that supports that view, but equally, we haven't been able to say that that does not happen in the cases that we haven't resolved. I think I'm right in saying that, that there is no, there are no cases where we have investigated that as being a hypothesis, where we have been able to demonstrate that that has actually happened. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for what has been a really important session for us. I guess um, future committees will have, uh, and our own hopefully next year, will have a much better understanding of the processes that we've gone through. Your evidence has been most helpful, and uh, the detail which you're going to follow up in writing to us will be an added benefit. Um, I'm going to close the meeting at this stage uh, with thanks to you all for coming. Uh, and note that at the next meeting on Wednesday, the 5th of November, the committee will take evidence from the Minister on Wildlife Crime 2013 Annual Report and will take evidence on a draft budget from stakeholders on the forestry theme. So thank you very much. I close the meeting completely just now and uh, wish you all good afternoon. <laughs>